I know that you've all enjoyed having Amanda for the last couple weeks, but she was unable to, to help tonight. So you guys get me back. You're welcome. Well, we have a great program today. Mr. Shea. Yes, did I get it? Yes, you did. Yes. yes thank you. <laughs> Is it French? Uh, Italian, actually. Italian. Yeah, they're still over there. So, uh. <laughs> he received his PhD in American history from Florida State University in 1975. He worked for the Virginia Department of Corrections from 1974 until retiring in 2014. He served in the U.S. Army Reserves from 1973 until retiring in 1993 as Lieutenant Colonel. Since 2015, he has taught American history at the University of Richmond's Osher Institute. Also, he has taught at Dogwood Terrace Retirement Community and Gray Star Retirement Community. We also have a handout for those that are just coming in. Here you go. Did I forget anybody? Your wife in the back. All right, and then I will take it away. Okay, thank you, uh, Lauren. Can everybody hear me back there? Uh, oh, thank you. Applause already. That's really a good sign. Well, thank you for that very nice introduction, and it's good to be here at Covenant Woods to speak to you tonight uh, about World War II. Um, this is a series that um, we offer um, called Speaking Historically, and um, it's a series of discussions, and I emphasize discussions. It's not a one-way uh, presentation, but hope to hear from you a little bit later tonight. Um, as Lauren said, um, uh, my name is Louis Che, I um, have a PhD in history from Florida State, and uh, I'm teaching at the University of Richmond's Osher Institute uh, right now. Um, we'll be uh, talking tonight about the U.S. Um, involvement in the war in Europe uh, I do it topically because I find it a lot easier to do Europe separately and then uh, the Asian theater. Uh, to try to do it chronologically back and forth is really confusing if you do it that way. So it's uh, uh, easier for me to, uh, and for you, I think, to follow uh, the themes that happen uh, in, uh, in Europe. But uh, next time... Uh, on June the 6th, which I know is D-Day, um, uh, we'll be talking about the U.S. involvement in World War II in the Asian theater. So we'll do them, we'll do them separately. And all the presentations are from 7 till 8 uh, o'clock. And um, here's our outline of what we're going to cover. Um, talk about the method that we're going to use tonight, the historical method, and what that involves, um, and then we'll talk about the, the scope of the war, um, and then some concepts that I think give context to uh, our, our discussion about World War II. Um, and then um, we'll get into what is called the narrative, that's the events them, themselves starting in 1920, uh, and then we'll look at President Roosevelt's uh, uh, management of uh, American diplomacy during the uh, 1930s, which amounts to isolationism, non-involvement uh, in the military and political uh, events in, in Europe. Uh, and that's encapsulated in the Neutrality Acts of the 1930s. Uh, following that, we'll uh, go into the uh, events of the war, um, and uh, talk about the meeting between uh, President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Churchill at Placenta Bay uh, in 1941, very significant meeting. Uh, and America, of course, is moving away from isolationism at that point, meeting with a belligerent uh, England at that time. Um, so um, uh, we will um, 
uh, discuss that. And then uh, we'll look at wartime diplomacy uh, by uh, Roosevelt uh, and um, uh, its ineffectiveness in gaining the, the goal of World War II, which was to free Eastern Europe. Uh, instead, uh, Eastern Europe is now controlled by the Soviet Union. Uh, and then we'll come to some conclusions about, uh, uh, about World War II in Europe. And then following that, we'll, we'll talk about uh, uh, I have some discussion questions. Uh, if we don't have any uh, uh, questions from from the uh, from the floor tonight, uh, but we will give some time to to hear from you. So that's our that's our game plan. And uh, so let me start um, with um, the nature of history, the nature of what we're talking about. Uh, in these next two sessions. And um, history has to do with uh, two things, uh, the reconstruction of the past and the reinterpretation of the past. That's what history really involves. When we talk about reconstruction, we're talking about the events, what happened. And that's, we derive that from newspaper reports, uh, memorandums, uh, uh, formal government documents, um, and um, uh, now uh, TV uh, and uh, now uh, internet reports all uh, give us the report of what, what is happening. But it's more than just a recapitulation, a chronology of what happened. Uh, we interpret what happens. We assess what it means. What does World War II amount to? And that is based on three things. Uh, your education, which is what we're doing tonight, uh, your life experiences. We, I was talking to one of the uh, members tonight about her experiences in, uh, in, uh, in Munich, Germany. And um, so that impacts how you look at things and also your vantage point on where you are uh, in, your, in your life. So those things all uh, impact on your evaluation of of what is going on. Now our purpose is here is to um, uh, develop generalizations um, and principles to help us solve political, economic, and diplomatic pro uh, problems. Uh, how can we get the peace? That's really the question. What is the best strategy to affect the peace? And that's what we're going to try to develop in these next uh, at least two sessions that we're that we're going to have. And one historian um, sums it up this way. He says, historical studies uh, significantly contribute to the development of gen general theories of human behavior useful to men trying to find solutions to the practical problems that confront them. So what we're going to try to do is develop some theories, some generalization, some principles that will help us uh, bring peace. That is, uh, is the goal. Um, as far as the scope of the war, it's the greatest catastrophe in human history. Uh, nothing compares to World War II. Um, the, it, it involved all the major powers. It engulfed uh, uh, 30 countries. 100 million people, 60 million killed. More people are killed in World War II than all the wars put together up until that time. Uh, so that shows you just how uh, destructive this, uh, this event uh, turned out to be. And yet, um, we have had no world wars in the last 75 years. And that is just an incredible record uh, when you factor in the question of nuclear weapons. Uh, but uh, the, the reason that we have not had a world war uh, is because of nuclear weapons. That's the independent variable. That's the difference between what happened in the, Fel in the Peloponnesian War between Sparta and Athens in 455 BC and, and today. Uh, everything is basically the same except that one factor nuclear weapons, and that is what has kept the peace. Now, uh, 
I know when I say that, people say, well, how about Vietnam? How about Korea? Uh, yes, they were civil wars. They were regional wars, but there have been no world wars. And um, people ask me, well, um, what is the distribution of the losses, 60 million? Uh, what, how was that distributed? And um, I, I looked into that, and the Soviet Union lost 22 million people. I am not sympathetic. The Soviet Union caused this war. They made a deal with Hitler in 1939 that allowed them to take half of Poland, and that is what precipitated this great conflict. So um, when uh, Hitler double-crossed them, they had to fight back and take all their land back, and uh, that is why they uh, experienced such tremendous losses. Uh, China uh, lost 20 million. We'll talk about that next time on June the 6th. Uh, China is involved in two wars. China, China is involved in a war with Japan and also a war with each other between the communists and the nationalists, and, and that really uh, degrades the effectiveness of them, and that's why they, they lost so many, so many people. Um, uh, Poland lost six million because of the extermination camps there. Um, Germany lost five million, Japan three million. Uh, the rest of Europe, this would be uh, Belgium, Holland, Denmark, Norway, uh, two million. And Yugoslavia lost one million as a result of, again, of a civil war between the communists and, and the fascists in uh, Yugoslavia. To the uh, credit of President Roosevelt, um, the United States uh, only lost uh, 400,000. And that's a tribute to Franklin Roosevelt's leadership and his um, reliance on technology that rather than frontal assault that uh, was used uh, uh, going back to the Napoleonic Wars and which the Russians uh, did. The United States re re, uh, relied on technology, uh, air power, to prevent uh, great losses. Now, there's some concepts and some context that we need to have before we can talk about World War II, and that has to revolve around the ideas of idealism and realism in foreign policy. Now, when you're talking about idealism, you're talking about making decisions based on ideas like liberty, uh, laws, democracy, human rights, um, uh, a country's freedom. Um, that is an idealistic concept. Peace for the idealists come from treaties, from international agreements. Uh, the Bible has influenced the idealistic uh, uh, mentality. Uh, in the Old Testament, uh, God does the fighting. Um, it is not the fire and maneuver of the Israeli army that frees them from Egypt uh, in the book of Exodus and in the book of Joshua. They conquer Canaan, uh, but God does the fighting. Um, and in the New Testament, Jesus is an outright pacifist. He does not believe in violence at all. And um, uh, so it's from that biblical basis that you get the idealistic uh, point of view. Great idealists are Woodrow Wilson, uh, George W. Bush, uh, Albert Einstein, although Einstein developed the atomic bomb. Um, Robert Oppenheimer was the physicist that physically was able to practically deliver it. Um, but Einstein became a very uh, pacifist person as a result of, of the development of the atomic weapons. Uh, Oppenheimer lost his mind over it uh, and thought that he had done the worst thing ever. Uh, and um, um, uh, I only wish that he had lived a little longer. He died in the mid-1960s. Uh, and I think if he had lived a little longer, he would have known that what he did was develop one of the greatest peacekeeping uh, instruments ever. And Franklin Roosevelt, we'll see, is an idealist. Now, the other school of thought is realism. Uh, and realism says you make decisions based on two things, power and geography. 
uh, for the realists, they look at the question of supply and logistics, how important they are. Um, for the realists, the balance of power um, uh, piece comes from a balance of power, uh, a balance of fear, a balance of terror. And uh, the great realists are Hans Morgenthau writing after World War II uh, in a book called Politics Among Nations and um, uh, another book by uh, George F. Kennan, the man I consider the greatest thinker of the 20th century, um, in a book called The Realities of American Foreign Policy, uh, written in 1954. Herman Kahn, another realist, uh, Henry Kissinger, and all the U.S. presidents during the Cold War will be, uh, will be realists, and that's why we were able to win the Cold War uh, without even firing a shot, at least not directly at the other side. Um, there are also some other concepts we need to keep in mind, and that is the, in, uh, the working of the international state system. And um, uh, the, the relationship between states today is based on fear and self-interest. We're seeing that in the Ukraine war, aren't we? That uh, uh, it's the fear of uh, Ukraine being taken over by Russia, Russia's fear of, of a hostile alliance right on its border. Uh, and uh, so that is what motivates uh, nations and uh, sets the relationship between states. Each state acts as its own sovereign. Uh, they decide what is best for them and what is correct to do. Um, and that, the reason for that is that there is no international court. I know there is a world court, but no one pays attention to it because there is no international police force that can implement the rulings of, the, uh, of a world court. So uh, it is for those factors that you have basically anarchy uh, in the international state system. And we talked a little bit about the balance of power, and the balance of power means the sum of your forces and their distribution across the globe. Um, and the balance of power also has a, a question of prestige and reputation attached to it. It's not always how much force you have, but your history of, uh, uh, of your past uh, influences the perception of the balance of power. And the balance of power also exist in the mind of, of people, as well as the objective number of forces that you have. Uh, Roosevelt rarely thought in terms of the balance of power. Sometimes he did, but rarely thought in terms of the balance of power. Hitler usually thought in terms of the balance of power, and when he did, he was very successful. Um, Roosevelt, or uh, Churchill, and um, Stalin always thought in terms of the balance of power, as we'll, as we'll see as we go through this. Now, turning to the, um, the narrative, the events of leading up to World War II, it starts in the 1920s. Uh, and um, the thing I, I want you to remember, if you don't remember anything else that I say tonight, this is the most important thing, that World War II is a result of World War I. And I can come back if you want to hear about the uh, reasons and the complexities that caused World War I, uh, just let uh, Lauren know and we'll, we'll set up a, a session on uh, World War I. But that's basically what triggered uh, World War II. Uh, specifically, it was the Treaty of Versailles that ended the war. Um, um, one of the provisions was a 33 billion, that is with a B, $33 billion um, to be paid by Germany to England and France in reparations, and um, a uh, war guilt clause uh, that Germany was totally responsible for World War I, which was very humiliating to, uh, to the Germans. Uh, Germany would be disarmed, uh, and um, uh, the Rhineland, that's the area between Germany and France, would be demilitarized. The, give France security, uh, and uh, popular sovereignty would determine uh, where nations would 
be drawn on boundary lines. This of course refers mainly to the uh, Austria-Hungarian Empire and the creation of Czechoslovakia, Austria, Hungary, um, and uh, Bulgaria, Romania. All these countries uh, would now be created after World War I as a result of the fall of the Austria-Hungarian Empire. The Republicans will win the election in 1920 uh, partly because of the disillusionment and cost that was involved in World War I. And they come to the conclusion that World War I was caused by an arms buildup, uh, which there was a, a significant arms buildup. They are correct on that. And so their answer to world peace is, well, we have to disarm. Uh, so they arranged for this Washington Naval Conference, Washington Disarmament Conference, 1921, and um, the net result is all the nations agree to disarm, even Germany and Japan. Uh, for the United States, we bring the army down from 5 million in World War I to 150,000. And the Navy, instead of building 30 ships, which she needs, builds, uh, builds nine ships and not enough aircraft carriers. Uh, as World War II uh, starts in the Pacific, uh, Japan will have 10 aircraft carriers. We will have three. So you can see the, the uh, balance of forces here uh, are really tipped quite a bit to um, uh, Germany and Japan, as we'll see in a minute. Um, and this fits the Republican mindset. The Republicans do not believe in high taxes and making uh, uh, individuals uh, pay a lot of taxes. And we all know that military expenditures are, are very expensive. And the Republicans did not want to do that. So this fit their mindset very well. And then in 1925, we have the Kellogg-Briand Pact. Um, S. Aristide Briand and Frank Kellogg, the Secretary of State, um, uh, says, uh, and again, Germany and uh, all the nations will sign this, uh, this document and says that war will no longer be an instrument of foreign policy. Uh, but there's no enforcement provision, and they make one exception, self-defense. Well, every country is going to name self-defense as their reason for going to war, aren't they? In, the, in 1846, when the United States invaded Mexico, uh, it was for self-defense. We were attacked by Mexican army, killed some of our soldiers in a disputed area in Texas, and um, uh, uh, we claimed self-defense. And of course, uh, Russia today is claiming self-defense because uh, a hostile, um, a hostile uh, alliance is on its border, and uh, Ukraine self-defense, they're being attacked. So uh, this document uh, really shows the ridiculousness of the thinking uh, that was going on at this time when you combine it with disarmament. Um, so the net result is you have isolationism, political and military isolationism, but not economic isolationism. The United States is trading enormously we're becoming the most powerful economic country in the world at this point and we are loaning the money to Germany so that they can pay England and France and England and France in turn are buying products from the United States with that money. What you're getting then is the tremendous prosperity of the 1920s um, and so that's what does it. That's how that, uh, that happened. In uh, the election of 1932, uh, Franklin Roosevelt and the Democrats uh, will win this election. And um, Roosevelt uh, will combine the, the worst of idealism with the worst of legalism. And what you will get as a result of that is disaster in the coming of the war with 3,000 American military personnel killed at the attack at Pearl Harbor, uh, and ineffectiveness after the war as Roosevelt, uh, because of some, again, misconceptions, will allow Russia to take all of Eastern Europe, as we'll, as we'll see 
here in a few minutes. Um, Roosevelt lacks a concept of what he wants to do. Um, he, he lacks firmness in what he wants. He's constantly saying one thing, doing another. Um, and instead of leading the people, uh, he deceives them. Uh, he doesn't educate the people in the importance of um, uh, Europe and uh, Asia uh, and uh, is very, therefore, ineffective. Uh, but Roosevelt is an educated man. He's a Harvard graduate. Um, he was assistant secretary of the Navy uh, during Wilson's administration in World War I. Um, and uh, he was nominated as vice president in 1920, uh, as his cousin Theodore also was assistant secretary of the Navy and uh, uh, a, a vice president uh, of the United States. Excuse me one second while I have a short beer here. Um, Roosevelt initially supported the idea of collective security in the League of Nations. Uh, and, um, but uh, he repudiated it and said he was not in favor of the League of Nations in order to get the Democratic nomination in 1932. So again, he changed, um, he changed his point of view. Uh, to uh, gain that, uh, stay in that office. But in fairness to Roosevelt, um, he was not really focused on foreign policy when, when he came into power. Uh, he was interested uh, in the economy. The farm, the factory, and finance were all in uh, decline, uh, absolute disarray, and uh, his mission was to uh, reform and reinvigorate uh, those, those dimensions of the American economy. And uh, also in 1934, uh, a commission was formed by the um, uh, Congress called the Nye Committee, uh, named after Gerald Nye, a North Dakota Republican. And they also studied the causes of World War I. But instead of looking at disarmament, their conclusion was it was economics that co brought us into World War I. And um, uh, especially corporations, munition corporations, who made a lot of money, which they did, uh, and uh, bankers who loaned money to England and France. And if Germany had won the war, all that money would have been lost. So there was a pressure to support England and France, uh, is what the Nye uh, Committee uh, concluded. And um, uh, the net result here, again, is isolationism. Avoid war at all costs. But uh, uh, isolationists were not the majority, uh, either in the Congress or in the press, as we'll, as we'll see as we go forward here. But the perception was that uh, they were very uh, outspoken. And they had one big advantage. They knew what they wanted. Roosevelt did not. And um, the uh, actualization of um, neutrality or uh, isolationism comes in the neut neutrality acts of the 1930s. And what we have um, in the first event was the Italy invades Ethiopia. A lot of Italians were in Ethiopia. Um, they were using it to develop markets uh, there and some raw materials. And the, um, the United States' response and Roosevelt's response was that no arms would be sold to the belligerents following along the Nye Commission thinking. And um, um, the situation then was that Italy had airplanes, tanks, machine guns, and uh, uh, Ethiopia had bows and arrows and spears to defend themselves with because the only people that really could give them arms is the United States. And Italy, of course, will conquer um, Ethiopia. Um, but corporations sell everything else to both Italy and Ethiopia. They'll sell them steel, machinery, agricultural products. They'll loan money. Uh, and this loophole is then closed the next year 
when the Spanish Civil War breaks out between the Democrats and the fascists. And now uh, the 1936 Neutrality Act says that there's no trade or loans to any of the belligerents uh, in this war, again, to keep us out of a European war. And Roosevelt's comment on all this is interesting. He says, if the nations revert to the law of the sword, then America has but one recourse, well-ordered neutrality. Well, I think everybody knows who he was. Uh, so despite the problems with Italy and Spain, it was really Germany that provided the, uh, the greatest threat to the United States. Germany, by 1935, is the strongest power in Europe. And it is led by an extraordinary leader, an evil genius who broke, broke uh, uh, Europe and Germany with a crash. Um, and being extraordinary doesn't mean good. It means influential. Adolf Hitler is the most influential person of the 20th century. Evil, but influential. Um, his goal is to reverse Versailles. And so the first thing he does is to remilitarize. He puts uh, the uh, unemployed into the German army. Uh, the unemployment rate in 1935 in Germany, uh, uh, when Hitler took over in 1933, uh, was uh, 33%. United States, 25%. So he had a major unemployment problem. His answer? put people in the military. Um, and the next thing he did is he uh, used that military to take back the Rhineland. Uh, again, there was no way that uh, England or France could do anything because they were unarmed. So uh, he was able to get away with that. But it, it was 1938 that was really Hitler's year. Um, um, he, he used the Versailles Treaty, of, or Versailles Treaty uh, provision of popular sovereignty um, to uh, claim Austria. And um, he said that uh, uh, the Austrian people were really Germans, which they had been part of Germany, is true. Um, and uh, the uh, prime uh, minister, uh, Kurt Schusnick, uh said, well, let's have a plebiscite, let's have a vote. Uh, Hitler did not trust democracy, and he then occupied Austria and then had the vote. And the result was a 99% approval rating uh, to uh, join Germany. He would have gotten about that anyway, most people say. Most scholars have looked at it. But again, he did not trust uh, democracy. Uh, next, uh, in um, a few months later, he demanded uh, the German speaking part of Czechoslovakia. Again, a reasonable demand. This is formally called Bohemia. It was at one time part of Germany, and uh, there were a lot of Germans in what he called the Sudetenland. Um, but unlike Austria, Czechoslovakia did have allies in France and Germany and Russia. Uh, but uh, France was willing to fight, but, German, but England, uh, traumatized from World War I, they lost a million men, uh, did not want to fight. Uh, and no way would uh, Poland allow uh, Russian troops to go through Poland uh, to come to the aid of Czechoslovakia. So uh, it looked like war was uh, going to happen. But uh, Prime Minister uh, Chamberlain uh, met with Hitler uh, at Munich, in uh, late September of 1938 and for negotiations to avoid war. And um, uh, basically the, the outcome was that the uh, France and um, England uh, gave Czechoslovakia, this part of Czechoslovakia, uh, to uh, Hitler to appease him. And this is all very well portrayed uh, in a Netflix new movie that came out a, about a month or two ago, uh, which I highly recommend. It's a dramatization of all this, and um, it shows the, uh, the tensions that were uh, in um, uh, the situation there in uh, Czechoslovakia. 
Well, uh, Roosevelt's response to this is two words, good man. Uh, but um, uh, the Munich uh, crisis was really the turning point in the war. Uh, most perceptive people knew that war was coming. Uh, and um, uh, you couldn't negotiate with Hitler. Uh, he had to be destroyed, uh, is the conclusion that uh, a few elites uh, uh, came to. Uh, and then in March 1939, true to his word, uh, Hitler uh, violated the Munich Agreement and took the rest of Czechoslovakia. Uh, and uh, in July of 1939, uh, Hitler next demanded um, what is called the uh, Dancing Danzig Corridor, a part of Poland. Again, this is reasonable on Hitler's part. Uh, this is part of, of a state called Prussia, uh, uh, and that, that area was part of Germany at one time, and um, uh, his demand was not totally unreasonable. But again, the way he was doing it uh, was objectionable. He was using force and intimidation, and again, uh, England and France are disarmed and can't do much about it. But uh, England and France uh, foolishly decide to secure uh, Poland. Now, there's no way they can get to Poland, and even if they could get there, they couldn't resupply. But they made this, again, idealistic commitment uh, to defend Poland. Uh, Hitler responds by making an a agreement with communist um, uh, Russia, and there's a secret provision. It's a non-aggression pact, but there's a secret provision that allows that um, uh, uh, Soviet Union can have half of Poland, and they do take it, and um, uh, Germany will take the western part of Poland. And that brings on uh, World War II, starting September uh, 1st, 1939. Um, the United States uh, seems to wake up a little bit and uh, changes the Neutrality Act called something called cash and carry. Here, um, uh, you are allowed to sell war materials to belligerents, but they have to pick them up on their own boats and um, uh, carry them back to their destination. Uh, of course, this favors England and France that has a bigger navy than, than the Germans do. By June of 1940, though, Hitler has conquered all of Western Europe, Denmark, Norway, and all of France is, is, is at his feet. And in July of 1940, uh, two events happened. First, Wendell Wilkie is nominated for the Republican nomination over Bob Taft. Uh, Taft, an isolationist, does not want to get involved in any way uh, in the war. Wilkie uh, wants to have some vague uh, involvement in um, international uh, action to prevent um, uh, the expansion of, of Germany and, and Japan. Uh, of course, Roosevelt will be nominated for the Democrats in 1940. Also, um, in that same month, the United States will uh, give uh, 50 uh, old World War I destroyers uh, to England. It wouldn't, really wouldn't make a whole lot of uh, difference. But again, talk about perception. Here, uh, the perception was that uh, we were getting a little more involved uh, in the war, symbolic support. Uh, for England. Uh, Hitler reacts to that in September uh, with the Tripartite Pact. And what that says is that uh, Germany, Italy, and Japan will come to each other's aid if they are attacked by a third country. Well, the only country that's not at war is the United States. So this is directed at the United States. And of course, later um, uh, Hitler will invade uh, the Soviet Union. He orders an air war over Britain, uh, and in September of 1940, Roosevelt uh, signs the order for a draft, wins by one vote in the Congress. 
uh, uh, and prior to that, unemployment was at 17%. All the things that Roosevelt did uh, did not really impact on unemployment, but the draft did. And in fact, we had to bring women into the workforce at that point uh, because now we needed uh, uh, people. And also in March of 1941, um, the Lend-Lease Law was passed, another neutrality act. And this allowed for all orders, uh, for all products on U.S. ships uh, to be uh, sold uh, to uh, anyone that wants it. And, of course, that ended the Depression. Uh, it is the war that ends the Depression, not anything that Roosevelt did. Um, and that really wasn't revealed or understood clearly until the early 1960s when economists started looking into that uh, dynamic. But that is what brings the end of the Depression was the tremendous amount of war orders that were coming in to our economy. Um, now we're moving away from isolationism as you can see step by step. Um, in June of 1941, uh, Hitler invades the Soviet Union and uh, Roosevelt immediately signs a billion dollar uh, aid package to the Soviet Union. Um, what do they do with that money? They purchase products from the United States, food and helping our farmers, and of course all of our factories are now 24-7 trying to fill all these war orders that are, are coming in. During the 1940 campaign, Roosevelt said this, no secret treaty, no secret obligation, no secret commitment, no secret understanding in any shape or form with any other government to involve this nation in any war or for any other purpose. And yet, uh, from August 9th to August 12th, 1941, Roosevelt met secretly with uh, uh, Winston Churchill in, in Placenta Bay, right off Newfoundland, and agreed to post-war principles. We weren't even involved in a war. We're, we're asserting post-war uh, principles in the Atlantic Charter. And the Atlantic Charter, a very idealistic document, says there'll be no territorial gains as a result of the war, uh, no change in government without the consent of the people, um, uh, reduction of tariffs, uh, free trade would be implemented, uh, the right of all people to self-determination, uh, a world free of want and fear, again, a tremendously idealistic concept, and um, and the disarmament of aggressor nations and a comprehensive disarmament of all. Roosevelt did not learn one thing from what was happening in front of him to, to agree to that concept. Uh, and the U.S. Army uh, could not support any operations and we didn't have a Navy that could operate even in one, one ocean, let alone two, to implement any of this. So uh, to meet with a belligerent and declare such principles uh, without any means to imp implement them is a surefire way to, to gain disappointment and disillusionment. And that is exactly uh, what happened. And according to Roosevelt's uh, uh, apologist and, and a very favorable three volumes that called uh, uh, FDR, uh, Nigel Hamilton uh, says that uh, Roosevelt said, if we were going to go to war, it would be for a noble cause. Um, and the British wanted to keep their empire, but the Atlantic Charter principles uh, would end not only their empire, but the French empire as well. Um, a post-war peace aimed that guaranteed the eventual end to the British Empire, especially in India. And Churchill said this to his private secretary on sending the draft uh, of the Atlantic Charter to his cabinet. Am I going to like it? Rather like a small boy about to take his medicine. Well, 
Well, in September of 1941, the United States is engaged in an undeclared uh, war, naval war in the Atlantic. Uh, we have armed our merchant ships. The U.S. Navy is aggressively protecting uh, convoys going over uh, to England. And on December, 20, uh, December 7th, uh, 1941, is really the turning point in the war, especially the war in Europe, because Russia will be able to hold the German offensive on that day. And on that very day, on that very hour that they were able to do that, on the other side of the war world, uh, the United States is attacked at Pearl Harbor and brings us into the war. Hitler, at that point, on December 11th, um, will uh, invoke the tripartite pact, the only thing he ever lived up to in his whole life, but he, he did uh, follow through on his commitment there and declared war on the United States. But Roosevelt makes a very key decision here. He decides that uh, he is going to put the priority on Europe uh, rather than on Japan, um, than, um, even though Japan attacked us. He knows that you have to resolve the European situation first. And that brings us to the diplomacy during the war. Um, Roosevelt's goal now uh, is realistic. Um, he wants to keep this uh, unusual coalition of communists and capitalists together. Hitler wants to uh, divide it. He wants to try to split that to uh, win the war for, for Germany. So at the Casablanca Conference, 1942, uh, they, they, they decide for uh, un, uh, unconditional surrender. Of course, the foolishness of that is that that really uh, galvanizes the Japanese as well as the uh, Germans to fight to the last man because there's not going to be any conditions uh, to their surrender. And at Tehran, uh, Roosevelt uh, gives a number of uh, real estate uh, to uh, the Soviet Union because we were not able to affect a, um, a second front. So Russia will get uh, Port Arthur uh, uh, in China, uh, half of Sakhalin Island in, uh, in uh, uh, the um, um, uh, Chinese area, and they would get a protectorate over Mongolia. All of this without consulting with China. Um, but that was the arrangement that uh, Roosevelt felt he had to make because the, Ger because the Russians were fighting the very best uh, troops uh, that the uh, Germans had. And then, of course, at Yalta, a complete catastrophe here. Um, uh, Roosevelt uh, uh, trusts the Russians that they will withdraw their troops, as we will, and that they will allow democratic elections in uh, uh, Eastern Europe. Of course, to a communist, uh, a democratic election means you can choose any communist you want. It does not involve real comp competition, and that's how uh, Stalin interprets that, and that's why uh, he will um, uh, uh, agree to it, because his understanding of democratic elections is what I have just uh, outlined. So here is the net result of, of World War II. Uh, Russia has conquered all of Eastern Europe, uh, bigger now than Peter the Great, Catherine the Great. Um, they are a, a massive force. So um, what conclusions can we come to about all of this? Um, first, Roosevelt's idealism distorted his view of the German threat. Uh, he did not react quickly enough uh, to the expansion of Germany. And he lacked coherence, consistency, and a concept of what he wanted to do. So different from the Cold War, uh, the war between the United States and the Soviet Union, when we did have a concept, which was containment. He tried to contain the Soviet Union. Um, Roosevelt himself, I think, was truly an isolationist. Um, when he did realize the options, he didn't educate the people. He deceived them. And that Yalta trusted the Soviet Union to live up to its agreements rather than to seek a balance of power, which would have been uh, better uh, 
through going through uh, the Dardanelles and up through some of Eastern Europe to cut off some of the expansion that the uh, Soviet Union uh, had uh, achieved um, as a result of the war. So um, let me stop here. I've got some discussion questions, but I, I, you've been so patient listening to me here. Um, I just wanted to ask you what uh, comments or questions do you have at this point? If you just raise your hand. Lauren's got the mic, so I'll come if you to have you. any, we'll... Uh, yes, sir. With uh, Finland wanting to go to NATO, is that going to cause any problem between Finland and Russia? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that, Lauren. What? With uh, Finland wanting to join NATO, what kind of problem do you see uh, causing uh, between the two countries and the uh, uh, U.S.? I didn't, didn't hear what. I'm Finland. sorry. Finland. NATO? Oh, Finland. Will Finland causing joining NATO uh, cause a problem? Um, from a, a realistic point of view, and I, I'm in the realistic school of foreign policy, um, to extend NATO all the way to a hostile border, well, what, a what would happen if Russia decided to uh, have an alliance with Mexico, Venezuela, and Nicaragua in our hemisphere. How would we feel about that? Uh, so I, I think it's a very dangerous and risky course. Uh, I think the whole involvement of uh, NATO uh, in this war is extremely risky. Um, uh, we're risking a nuclear war uh, at this point. So uh, I think it's ill-advised, let me put it that way. If you don't mind well, taking your mask off, I might be able oh, to hear oh, you a little bit better there. Okay. Um, my comment on that is, okay. my comment on that is, is that when Russia invaded Ukraine and, and kind of wanted to take over the whole country, they were going to be butting up to Poland, which is already in NATO. So the fact that if they wanted to take Ukraine over and they were fine with that, having Poland, who's NATO on their border, what's the difference with Finland being in NATO? It's the same thing. All, they just wanted a reason to invade Ukraine, period. I don't think it makes a difference to them. They just needed a reason to substantiate it to their public so that they could go in, take over Ukraine, meet whatever wish list of Putin. Because in, in fact, he's gonna have NATO on the border if he takes over Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the point she makes is that um, Russia is going to have NATO on its borders even if it conquers Ukraine. And uh, your, yeah, your point's well taken. Uh, that certainly uh, um, uh, can happen. Uh, and I think the reason that Russia has gone on to Ukraine uh, is because they're not part of NATO and they can get away with it. At least they thought they could. Uh, but the, um, the uh, technology of the um, uh, uh, NATO forces have, have kind of had a balance of power there. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. The information that I have is that, or that I have been reading, is that Finland has the best military pre preparedness of any nation in that part of the world. And that's much more of a threat to Russia. You know, in, uh, in 1940, um, the Soviet Union invaded Finland. And Finland, little Finland, was able to defeat the Soviet Union, lock, stock, and barrel. And this event impacted Hitler. H Hitler thought, well, gee, if little Finland can defeat the Russians, well, we'll be able to wipe them out very quickly. Uh, and, of course, that uh, is a fatal, uh, a fatal decision because uh, Russia is so big and um, the weather uh, is just so negative, um, uh, it just really cannot, it cannot be defeated easily. Uh, and Napoleon found that out too, didn't he? He invaded the Soviet Union uh, with 600,000 troops 
uh, and was, uh, uh, was defeated, not by the Soviet army, but by the weather and the burning of Moscow, which took all their food and, and supplies away. And uh, so, um, uh, uh, but uh, yes, Finland is formidable, I would say, yes. Well, I have a I have a couple of discussion questions here. Um, let me ask uh, let me ask you. Um, we have a couple minutes. Um, uh, why do you think disarmament was ineffective in avoiding World War II? Because that was a theory that uh, well, if you disarm, you you won't have war. That will guarantee the peace. Yeah. If you, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you just, that, that, I mean, that is certainly the, the biggest uh, lesson we talked about. What lessons can we come to? And that is disarmament does not work. Whenever you hear about, uh, oh, let's, uh, let's have disarmament, uh, remember, well, we tried that in the 1920s, and that brought on 60 million deaths. Uh, we've been armed to the teeth since 1945 with nuclear weapons, and um, um, we've, we've had peace. Yes, sir? We're now trying that in America with defund the police and see what it's getting us. Uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't hear. Defunding the police. Defunding the police. Defunding the police. That's where. Yeah, defunding the police is a... Uh, is kind of a related uh, issue too, isn't it? Uh, um, the um, many people um, feel that um, you know that the um, that 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 is the oppression uh, that the police have, and of course they are very short-sighted and ill-advised in in that type of thinking. And that, to me, it's that's just purely ridiculous. Uh, yes, sir, all the way in the back there. I'm coming, Mr. Connor. Lauren has to double time to get there. And in my opinion, Finland joining NATO could very mean the ending of any country taking over another country. It may be the beginning of a unified world. I didn't get all that, Lauren, but something about NATO and... If Finland takes over NATO, or joins NATO, it will be the beginning of a unified world, was what he was saying. I, I don't see that happening. I, I think the powers of, of nationalism are just so strong that I don't think you'll ever really see a unified world, one world order uh, situation. Um, um, the two great dominant forces of the last 150 years are nationalism and socialism. They're the two things that are just unstoppable, in my view. He says he prays that he's right. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I think our time is about up. Uh, thank you all so much for coming. Uh, appreciate it. Thank you so much. Hope to see you on June the 6th. Yes, come back for part two on June the 6th. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you. I am.